Shalom, it's Levi Shore. Welcome back to Sweet and Torah. We're going to learn something incredible today. We're going to learn all about the ten plagues uh, that are in Parsha by Era and Parsha Bo. But we're going to learn something more extraordinary. We're going to learn about the ten plagues that are coming in the future during the days of Mashiach, the days of the Messiah. I learned this years ago in the Gemara where it says, like the, the, the final gula, the, the gula shlema, the complete redemption in the days of Mashiach, it's going to be just like the Geula from Mitzrayim. It's going to be just like, you know, the, the exodus from Egypt. So I never really saw this in detail. I knew about this concept, but I had no idea, like, where to look for it. So recently I, um, <coughs> recently I bought a uh, Midrash Tanchuma and a Midrash Yalkut Shemoni, and all the secrets are buried in there. So we're going to learn incredible things about the ten plagues that are happening in the days of Mashiach, and we're going to learn about the secret history of Edom and the Roman Empire. It's going to be really fascinating if you stick around. Uh, we don't know exactly how it's all going to unfold. The Rambam, the Rambam, he says that uh, right until the events of Mashiach actually happen, I mean, they can happen in many different ways. The, the Nevuah, the prophecy, Hashem can fulfill it in many different ways. It depends on like what we do, how we act. But uh, we're going to get a glimpse, and, it, and it's really incredible. It's really the first time I'm really seeing it, so I really want to learn this a lot better and maybe do some videos in the future. But um, our journey will begin in Midrash Tanchuma, and he quotes uh, Rebbe Elazar ben Padas. And he says, he says, just as the Makos, just as the plagues were brought upon Mitzrayim, were brought upon Egypt, so too in the future they will be brought upon the Malchus Edom. So who's the Malchus Edom? It's the, it's the Roman Empire. And we'll talk all about the origin of the Roman Empire and different phases. And, and a lot of it is kind of like, it's not really, uh, it's kind of a secret history almost. It's, it's very interesting. So he's going to quote from uh, Yeshaya uh, 23.5, uh, the prophet Isaiah. And he quotes and says, Ka'asher shema lemitzrayim yachilu keshema tzor. So it's interesting. So it says, like, when the news reaches Egypt, they will tremble as when uh, Tzor, which is translated as Tyre, hears the news. So Rebbe Eliezer, he teaches us, and he says, he says, um, any time in the Torah it says the word Tzor, so the word Tzor, it should be spelled uh, Tzadik Vav Resh, but sometimes it's just spelled Tzadik Resh. It says anytime it's Chaser, anytime it's missing the Vav, um, it's talking about the Malchus Edom. It's talking about the kingdom of Edom. It's talking about the kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire. And why are they called Tzor? Because they're Meitzara. They, they trouble, they're Meitzara uh, Yisrael. They trouble the Jewish people all throughout history. So who's, who's the origin of Edom? Edom's Esav, the twin brother of Yaakov. And, uh, and it says in the Gemara that Esau's children eventually go on to found uh, the Roman Empire. We're going to see a little more detail of how that all happened. So it says in the al Shimoni that every Maka, every one of the Makos, every one of the plagues that Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, brought upon the Mitzrim, upon the Egyptians, so too in the future He's going to bring upon them. So we're going to have to see. So, so Tyre is an ancient city in Lebanon, modern-day Lebanon. And, and how does this relate to Edom? How does this relate to Rome? You know, so we're going we're gonna to get some clues here. So, right, so it says, that, right, it says in the Gemara that um, the Roman Empire was founded by, uh, by Edom, by uh, the children of Esau. And there's a famous, uh, and I forgot where these are in the Gemara. I have to look them up and get the exact sources. But it says when uh, Shlomo HaMelech, when King Solomon, when he married the, the, the Bas Paro, the daughter of the Pharaoh at the time when he was king, I believe it says Gavriel, the, the, the Malach Gavriel, the angel Gavriel, he went and he planted a little reed in the Mediterranean Sea. And then I think like, like um, you know, sand and dirt started to form around that reed. And then many years later, that becomes the, uh, the continent uh, of Italy. And it's always been fascinating because Rome, you know, of course, founded in the country of Italy, and it looks like a boot. And for sure, it was a symbol of the Roman Empire that was going to step on and conquer the world, you know, founding their modern empire. Now, where was the ancient Edom? So after um, Yaakov leaves uh, the land of Israel and he goes to um, his mother's brother, Lavan, so he, he eventually is going to get married to uh, Leah and Rachel, Leah and Rachel. 
um, his brother Esav starts to, to found a mighty empire. And it says like he went to this place called Har Seir, Mount Seir, and the Torah recounts that he, um, he, he was at war with these people, the Chorim, and eventually they start to intermarry and they become like one tribe, they become one nation. And then there's the Alufe, the, the chiefs, the chiefs, the presidents of, um, uh, of Esav. So where was that? So that was in modern, um, modern day Jordan. It's in the southern part. It was in the southern part of that. Maybe a little part was going into the Sinai Desert, but it was southern Jordan. I believe it's around Petra. It's somewhere around Petra and possibly around that mountain, one of those mountain ranges is Har Seir. And it's possible that uh, um, Esau's children, they, they actually built Petra. But then from there, it seems that the children of Asa, they're going to, some of them are going to wander up into modern day Lebanon. That's why the Torah is calling Sur, this uh, city called Tyre in Lebanon, it's going to say that's also related to Edom somehow. It's related to the children of Asa. So it's interesting. So if we go into like secular history, there's the famous epic poem by Homer, uh, the Greek poet. And it seems it's possible that this city of Tyre could have been the city he was talking about called Troy. And that Sor is, um, is, is kind of related to this. So, so the city of Sor could be, could be Troy. And it's related to Mitzrayim in grammatical ways as well, because the word Mitzar is like a constriction, like something that holds you back. And Mitzrayim was holding us back. And it can also be like, like we said before, it can be like giving someone else trouble, giving them, you know, tsaurus, you know, trouble, pain, you know, and then, you know, in, in all throughout history, we were kind of, you know, persecuted somewhat by, you know, the Roman Empire. We can talk about that. So there's a relationship between even uh, Mitzrayim, Egypt, and, and, and Sor grammatically. So, so right, Homer said it was this ancient Greek poem, and there was Paris, who's sometimes called Alexander, which is interesting because Alexander the Great, he was the one that, that began the Greek Empire. But Paris, he was a son of Troy's king named Priam, and he, and he, and he captured uh, Queen Helen, you know, Helen of Troy, the famous queen renowned for her beauty in the ancient world. And she was the queen of a Greek king named Menelaus. Now, I believe Menelaus is all confusing. It's like, I believe Menelaus, he was brothers maybe of Agamemnon, who was this great Greek warrior general. And that was the famous Achilles and the, the story of the Achilles heel in this. And he's a great warrior. And then there's Odysseus and Ajax. And it's kind of like this great epic battle, this great action movie. And probably a lot of action movies, they get their format from, uh, from the Iliad, where you know you have certain levels of like the villains and the heroes, and they fight each other. We see a lot in the comic books. And then you have the major battle. I think one of the major battles between Hector and Achilles, or I, I forgot, <laughs> it's been years since I read. So then on the Trojan side, so right, so the Greeks are coming to get back Helen, and this whole war is being started because uh, Paris ca captures Helen. And then uh, Paris's brother is this mighty warrior named Hector, is the prince. There's King Priam. And then there's this person that doesn't have a big role in the Iliad. And, I, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but his name is Aeneas. And he was a nobleman of the Trojans. And then, you know, the story goes, Odysseus is big fighting back and forth. And Odysseus comes up with the Trojan horse, this big wooden horse. And the, uh, the Greeks were hiding inside, you know, this horse. And, and the Trojans wheel it into the city. And then they surprise attack and they conquer Troy. So Troy is destroyed. But then, years later, and I believe it was during the reign of Emperor um, Caesar Augustus, and he, uh, there, was a, there was a Roman poet now uh, named Virgil, and he, he wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to write an epic poem, and this was going to be about the mythic founding uh, of the Roman Empire. So what he describes in the Aenid, and I, I have no idea how to pronounce all these, um, is that Aeneas... And the rest of the survivors of Troy, they, they, they're now like exiles, they're refugees. So they leave Troy, they leave uh, Lebanon, and they go to Carthage, which was, uh, it was an ancient empire in um, northern, northern Africa. And I think there's the famous, you know, I think Hannibal was one of the great uh, Carthage uh, generals, or, and he like leads this invasion of Rome. <coughs> I think with these elephants, they went through the mountains, whole story of them. So he meets Dido, who's the queen of Carthage, and they're welcome there for a year, for a while. 
And then, you know, it's a whole mythic journey. They go through the underworld and they go through Elysium, which I think was like the Roman conception of like some kind of heavenly worlds. And then finally they, they make it to Italy. They, they go to the Tiber River. And there they meet uh, this man named Latinus. And he's the king of that area. So uh, Aeneas, he makes a, uh, like an alliance with Lavinia, who's the princess, who's the daughter of Latinus. And then there's this whole big war where they go to war with someone named Turnus. <coughs> and he's the king of this people called the Rutuli. And there's a war between Turnus and his people. And then the Trojans, led by Aeneas, they, they make an alliance with the Etruscans, <laughs> who's Latinus' people. So they win. He marries Lavinia. And then they found a city called Lavinium. And then I think the purpose of this, like Virgil was saying, that Aeneas, he's an ancestor of the twins, Romulus and Remus, and they're the twin brothers that, that found uh, Rome. So they start Rome. Okay, so who, right, who's Edom? Um, so it's interesting. I first heard this idea from uh, Rabbi Zachs, who was uh, the grandson of the uh, Chofetz Chaim. He, he lived in Kiryat Sefer. We were, I was there for a Shabbos when I used to live in Israel, and he mentioned this idea that America, that, that the USA was Edom. I, and it was, it was fascinating. I never heard that concept before. So <clears throat> it, sa it says in the Gemara, right? It says in the Gemara, it says in many places in the Meforshim that, right, that Edom founds Rome. And what's interesting is it seems like we're very close to these, these, these prophecies we're about to get to. It says in Masekta of Odazara that right before the coming of Mashiach, Paras, Persia, Iran will fall into the hands of Edom, will fall into the hands of Edom. And, uh, and Edom, in this case, I, I think means the United States. And then Edom will rule the whole world for nine months. So what's fascinating about this is if we go back to that Midrash Tanhuma, when it says that the 10 plagues will befall Edom, this means on a global scale, possibly. Because if Edom, if America, the American Empire rules the entire world, then these plagues will, will you know, will cover the, it'll be a global. So like Hashem will show his power on a global scale. And then it says in the Zohar, on Parsha Shmos, it's 32a, if you want to look it up, there's going to be these three wars between Edom and Yishmael, meaning between the Western powers, you know, America, you know, England, France, and Yishmael, and the Arab powers. Now, there's connection between Paras and Yishmael. It says in many places, um, Persia, Iran, you know, they, they've adopted the religion of Yishmael, and in some sense, they've, they've almost won like the power and control of the Arab people from Saudi Arabia. Right now, the real, the real Melech, the real king uh, of the Arab nations, in some ways, is really the Ayatollah and Iran. And there's going to be these three great wars. One's going to be on the ocean, one's going to be on the land, and one's going to be around Jerusalem. And it seems like we are very close to the first of these wars, and we see it with, like, Iran began to flex their power and, and a horrible, horrible attack on Shabbos Simchas Torah, on October the 7th in Israel, and all these proxy groups that Iran's controlling, they control Hamas, Hezbollah, and Lebanon, modern-day Lebanon. They, Iran imse themselves, their, their armies, you know, some of their soldiers are in Syria, and they're controlling the Houthis in Yemen, and now they're starting to block, you know, commercial traffic coming through the Red Sea, and it's causing a major conflict. I think America, England, France, and some other nations are now fighting against the Houthis, and, and it seems like we're very close to this war. And it's also, we'll talk about, it seems weird in some ways that, um, like, these ten plagues would come against Edom when, really, in the modern world, we're being attacked by Yishmael, we're being attacked by the Arab terrorist groups, but really we're being protected in, in America, in France, in, uh, you know, England and, and the rest of the countries of Europe, so it seems strange. Historically, right, historically, the ancient Roman Empire, they destroyed the, the Second Temple. You know, there was the persecutions, there was the slaughter of the Jewish people during the Crusades. There was the uh, Spanish Inquisition. You know, there was, the, you know, all kinds of pogroms all throughout, um, you know, the Middle, uh, you know, Middle, middle Ages in, in Edom. So, but it seems strange now. But I, I think a lot of this is hiding all under the surface. Um, in some ways, we, we see it like the Biden administration, they, they freed up tens of billions of dollars to Iran, and this is funding all that terrorism. I mean, 
in some ways secretly, you know, not so publicly stated, but America kind of in some ways financed uh, that, that terrorist attack by, by supplying Iran. I mean, it's some, you know, in some kind of policy of appeasement, but in essence, that money goes to Iran and then Iran can fund these terrorist attacks. So we'll, we'll go back to, we'll talk more about it later. All right, so well, let's actually jump into the plagues and it's really fascinating. So the first plague was Dom, was blood. And Hashem used this plague to show his, his power, you know, over, um, over everything people need to live. And, and there's Midrash, Midrashim and Mepharshim that say that it was like a general and he's going to, when he attacks an enemy army, he's going to cut off their water supply. So blood and water are, are, are extremely important. Um, if a person doesn't have water for, I think, like um, maybe three, I forgot exactly how long a person can live, but, it, but if a person doesn't have water, let's say three days or more, it, it can be very dangerous. A person could lose their life. And, and uh, the same thing with blood. If a person loses too much blood, the lowest level of the soul, the nefesh, separates from the body. And then a person can no longer live. So the Yalkut Shemoni, the Midrash Yalkut Shemoni, is going to go through each plague. And he's going to say, like Hashem, he brought this upon Mitzrayim, and so too in the future will he uh, bring it on Edom, it seems, according to the Midrash Tankuma. So he quotes he quotes a Pasuk from Yoel Hanavi, from Joel the prophet. And this is in the third chapter, uh, the third verse. So it's Joel 3.3. 3. And he says, Vinasati mosim hashemayim uva arets dam vaesh vesimros. And it's sent, interesting. So he says, "I will set wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke." So then he goes on and he says something really incredible: that not only is there going to be plagues on earth, but it seems like Hashem is going to completely change like how the heavens look. And it says, Hashemesh Yehafech, that the sun's going to turn to darkness. And uh, I'm sorry, Hashemesh Yehafech Lechoshak, that the sun will turn to darkness. Vehayareach Lidam. And then the moon is going to be for blood. It's going to look blood red. And it's a simon, it's a sign. Unfortunately, there's going to be great wars and destruction in the world. And this is Lifne Bo Yom Hashem. And this is before what a lot of the Nevi'im, what the prophets talk about, the, the day, the great and awesome day of Hashem. And we can go more into this in the future of some of these uh, prophecies. It's really fascinating stuff. So I have some commentary on this. So the al Sheikh, he says that Dam, blood, symbolizes Edom. So why, why does blood symbolize Edom, the Roman Empire? It's, it's the bracha that uh, Yitzhak gave to his son Esav, that he would um, he would be uh, you know tichia lecherev like harvecha tichia you will live by your sword, and Yitzhak gave his son Esav this great blessing, and all through the different phases of the Roman Empire, even today you can see it in modern America, the American Empire, there's just this military supremacy of of the children of Esav. They they just, they are just blessed to win you know wars. And they have this great military power as they build empire after empire. So then it says, Aish fire is con compared to Bavel, to the Babylonian Empire, because they, they threw like servants of Hashem into the fire. I mean, one was in the days of Nimrod, like uh, Abraham. Abraham was thrown into the fire. And then in the days of Daniel, uh, like I can probably gonna forget the names, like Mishael, Azariah, and maybe it's, I forgot the third. But they, they were thrown into the fire and they miraculously survived. And then it says, like, the Persians and the Greeks are symbolized by these timros, these pillars of fire. And it's related to the word tomer, like a palm tree. And it's scary, but you can almost see, like, you know, the mushroom clouds. They also could look like palm trees, like these big explosions, or could just be conventional weapons. When we see, like, cities are taken out, there's pillars of smoke and fire. And then it says, Amalek's destruction is symbolized by mosim hashemayim, by wonders in heaven. So Amalek was the grandson of Edom, and, and we have a tradition, you know, that uh, the Nazis, they, they, were, they were Amalek, and they just, they've been fighting a war against the Jewish people for thousands of years. So then it says, asher yikra Hashem But then it says that it will be that all who call on the name Hashem, they will escape. They will escape these scary, dangerous times. And the Redak says that all who turn to Hashem in sincerity will be saved 
in sincerity will be saved from the great destruction. So anyone in the world that calls to Hashem, prays to Hashem to save them, they will be saved. The Gemara tells us only two things can protect us, you know, well in these times, these crazy times we live in. Learning Torah, doing the mitzvot, and Gemilus Chasadim, doing kindness for others. Bizrat Hashem, may we be saved and both see the miraculous uh, coming of Mashiach in these crazy times. And the Abarbanel says that the entire Jewish nation who will return to Hashem, they will all be saved. All right, so the next plague is Sephardim, the frogs, the Sephardea. So once again, the Yalkut says that... Um, Right in Mitzrayim, Hashem brought frogs, and in the future, Hashem's going to bring some kind of uh, plague of frogs, maybe on a global scale. I don't know, it's going to be very interesting. Um, and the frogs were brought because there was, the, you know, the Egyptians were, were using harsh, you know, harsh statements against the Jews, you know, ordering them around, you know, in the slavery. And, and, and we see it in, you know, in the, the, the anti-Semitic, you know, the... the the, the shouts of the anti-Semites, you know, against the Jewish people, and then the frogs, so the sound of the, the frogs were, uh, you know, the punishment for that. And I, I had a hard time looking this one up. It says here it's in Yeshaya, I think, the 63rd chapter. It's Kol Sha'on Ma'ir. So I, I had a little trouble finding that one. I'll have to look it up more in the future. I right, next play Kinim, Lice. So this is fascinating because it says that... Um, the kinim, the lice, they, they came from the soil, and the sorcery had a limitation that anything smaller than the seed of a barley corn, uh, sorcery magic had no effect on. But here, if you know, we see this in the days of Mashiach, what will be fascinating about the kinim here is that the power of science goes even to the subatomic level, where scientists have, you know, have power over, you know, atoms, splitting atoms, you know, nuclear power. And, and even breaking them into smaller subatomic atomic particles like quarks and bosons and you know leptons and all the all the fun stuff. But once again, the Yalkut Shimoni says that Hashem brought the kinim, the lice upon uh, Egypt, and they will be brought in the future. And he quotes a pasuk from uh, Yeshaya. It's in uh, chapter uh, looks like thirty four, and it says v'nech ku. Nikalecha litzefes, viafara ligafris, and this is a really crazy one. It says that the um, like the rivers are going to be turned to like some kind of pitch or tar, and the soil. So the the lice that came from the soil, they're going to be like sulfur, and the afar was only like kinim, and let's see, and this was. Right, so when they dug down into the soil, the whole soil for a certain like depth, it was all these lice. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to learn more about this. We'll, we'll do a more detailed uh, video in the future. So the next plague was the Arov, the, the mixture of the wild animals. And Hashem used these as like his own army, like an army to go and attack the Egyptians. And the Yalkut, once again, he says that, you know, Hashem brought this upon the Mitzrayim, and in the future there's going to be some kind of attack of, like, wild animals, where Hashem will use these animals as his uh, as his army. And it says here, once again, it's a Pasuk in Yeshai, the same place. This one's Lamed Dalet, Yud Aleph. It may be the same Pasuk. But it says, like, in the end, after the destruction, it says, the Yerusha Ka'as V'Kipot, that it's going to be so, like, it's going to be turned into, like, a wilderness area, like, almost an overgrown forest area, where only owls and bitterns will, will inherit it. And we'll talk about more about the owls and the bitterns soon. But it shows about the secret nature of all this. And we're going to talk about, we'll get a little into the, the secret societies of the wizarding world and, you know, information hidden from us muggles. All right, so the next plague was Dever. And Hashem was showing here that he controls, you know, the, the bacteria, the viruses, the illness. And, he can, and this, he put the illness, the disease on the animals specifically. So right, once again, the Yalku tells us this was brought upon Mitzrayim, this will be brought again in the future. And he quotes Yechezkel here, it looks like 38.22, Ezekiel. And he says, Benish pati, benish ito bedever. And he says, I will punish him with dever, with illness, and with blood and torrential rain and hail. Okay, so the sixth plague was Shechin, and this was a boil... The boils, and this, this afflicted all the Egyptians, and they are very severely affected. And one thing that was so tough about it is they were dry and moist. So if you put the medication in, 
that healed the moist kind of you know boil it, it would irritate the dry part and if you put the medication on to heal the dry part it, it would irritate the moist part so there's no way to have any kind of mess and to give any kind of relief and then all the egyptians and even the khartoumim even the sorcerers the necromancers they were all affected so they could barely get up and hashem was showing his complete control over all illness and sickness and in some ways health because you know hashem you know hashem rofecha hashem's our healer so it says the um, let's see he quotes here from zakaria yud dalit yud Bez. so it's uh zakaria it's uh looks like it's 14th chapter and it'll be the 12th pasuk the 12th verse and it says this will be the plague with which hashem will strike the nations the Ami countries or nations or countries that have fought against Jerusalem, that have fought against jerusalem and each one's flesh will melt away while he is standing on his feet and each one's eyes will melt away in their sockets and each one's tongue will melt away in their mouths this is it's very scary i think this is referring to there is potentially three wars of gog and magog and this is the most terrifying one and this is the third one now negative prophecy doesn't have to happen but this is the what we talked about before in the Zohar, the three wars, one on the ocean, one on the land, and one around Jerusalem. And this is a horrifying uh, prophecy where like the enemy soldiers of the world, like nations of the world, they come in and they attack Jerusalem and they, and they violate the women in Jerusalem. It's really horrible. And then like this is when Hashem actually splits the Harazesim and the Mashiach, you know, Alu Moshiim, Lahar, you know, Lahar Abayas, like the Lahar Zion, like the two Mashiachs, Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David. They come with the Shekinah of Hashem. They come in through the Golden Gate, you know, from the east. The Mount of Olives splits. Hashem Shekinah comes with them. And they come up to uh, the Harabias, the Temple Mount. And then they're going to get the revenge of all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem. And and just and it seems like it's a horrible disease. It, it sounds a lot like that scene. Um, and maybe this is where they got it from. In uh, Raiders of Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, Raiders of Lost Ark, where the Nazis... They open up the Arna Kodesh, they open up the Ark of the Covenant, and their faces are all like melting and their eyes are bold. It sounds like that a little bit, but it's a horrifying disease. And then uh, the seventh, the seventh Makkah, the seventh plague was hail, Barat. Barat. So here, this is really fascinating. So this is also in one of the, the wars of Gog and Magog, and I believe this is the first war. And it says, um, he quotes the Yalku Shimoni, he quotes, um, it looks like Yechezkel. It's Lama Ches, uh, Kaf Bey, so it's uh, Ezekiel um, 38, 22. And it says, the Geshem Shotef, and the Avne El Gabish. So the full passage is like, I will punish him with Dever. So, and there's interesting because um, our, the Midrashim say in Egypt, each one of the plagues also had Dever. There was some kind of sickness or illness that was associated with each one of the plagues and that's kind of interesting because we really haven't had these miraculous plagues all throughout history but when we talk about a plague we're usually talking about some kind of disease we're usually talking about some kind of epidemic or pandemic something like that is generally associated with a plague so he says that, that he's going to punish him with dever with disease and with dom with blood and which could be like you know um some kind of war you know battle torrential rain just huge you know wind storms just could be tornado, hurricane force winds. And then then that's the Geshem Shotef. And then the Avne Elgabish, the hailstones. Now, in Egypt, the hailstones showed Hashem's complete power over the environment, over the climate, the weather. And he took he took these hailstones, this frozen ice, and inside the frozen ice he had fire. And it was just it was it was a nace, it was a miracle. Like you can't mix fire and water together in the physical world. And the hailstones would come down. And my son was telling me, he learned in school, like it was the four kinds of punishment like the Sanhedrin would give. It was skila, someone could get hit by the rock. You could get a uh, serefa because the fire inside the hail would burn things. It would hit something and burn it up, burn up, you know, houses, fields. And then um, you could get the slicing, the hereg, the hereg, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the sword, you know, the cuts by sword, you get cut by the hail. And then the final one is the um, the the the, chenic, the, um, the choking, like and maybe just because all the smoke from the fire, but it's like the four kind of punishments, the four kinds of din were in the barab. And this one, I, I believe, is when Paro, when the Pharaoh actually said, he says like Hashem's a sadik, 
you know, we are the Rishayim, we are the evil ones. And he saw the justice, he saw the Mida Kanega Mida, the Mida Kanega Mida, the measure for measure that Hashem was punishing the Egyptians for everything they did to the Jewish people. And he saw the divine justice in it all. And it says that Hashem, you know, put a third of this onto ancient Egypt, a third of it was in the battle Yeshua bin Nun, hit the war he fought. Uh, Hashem took a, a third of that out. And then the final third will be in this final battle where Gog and his armies, the nation, the armies of the nations of the world will invade. And Hashem is going to destroy these modern armies. I mean, if you picture it, like modern, like advanced fighter jets and aircraft carriers and tanks and laser weapons and robotic weapons, and just drones, every kind of modern technology will be brought out, will be brought down by the same kind of plague, the same kind of maka that was sent on Egypt. So then the eighth one is the Araba, the locusts, and um, and the Yalkut Shimoni here, he quotes, see, it looks like he quotes Yechezkel 29, 17, and it says, and I believe this was, um, let's see, it says, now Ben Adam, Ko Amor Hashem Elohim, Hashem Elohim says, say to every winged bird, the seaport kol kanaf, lechol chayos hasadeh, and every wild animal in the fields. It says, assemble and come. He kapsu uvo, come, assemble yourselves together and come. So it says, hey asfu, gather together, gather together from all around for my feast that I slaughter for you, a great feast upon the mountains of Yisrael, eat flesh and drink blood. So it sounds horrifying. It's like when the enemy, um, Nations attack Israel one day during the days of Mashiach. These, these, uh, after they're defeated in a battle by Hashem, the the animals themselves will will, will eat them. So, and much and like the birds, like the, the predatory birds, so much like the locusts in the Tzrayim. And it's also interesting because there's four kinds of locusts mentioned in another prophecy of Yoel. So once again, we don't know exactly how this is all going to happen, but this is like a little glimpse into to possible and where to look for more information on all this. So then the ninth plague is Choshech, and the Yalkut Shimoni here, he quotes Yeshaya uh, 3411, Isaiah, and says, Venata Alecha Kav Tohu. Th this one's really fascinating. So this was quoted before, but he goes through the, the ed other end of the Pusik, and it's the Ka'as, the owls, and the Kipo, the bitterns, they will inherit, they will inherit a desolate land of Edom, the, the, the Yanshof, the great owls, and the Orave, and the ravens will live in it, and he will draw against it a line of tohu, a line of emptiness. And this was the state of like the raw matter you know, at the very beginning of the Mice of Reishi, it's the very beginning of creation. And there'll be stones of void, there'll be the avne bohu. So at first everything was like tohu and bohu, um, and that was the original state of creation, and then Hashem solidifies everything more in the Mice of Reishi, in the, the creation. What's interesting here is he uses the language of... Um, like, you know, measuring and using a plumb line and the weight of the plumb line, which are tools to measure like horizontally and vertically when you're building. But the construction here is the complete destruction, taking, taking this once mighty empire back to the, 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 the emptiness, the raw matter state, even before creation. Now here, it's interesting, it hints a lot about like secret things that are going on in Edom that haven't really come to the surface yet. Because, for instance, he uses, he quotes the bittern, which is a streaky brown and buff heron, a type of bird. And they have a shorter neck than, I guess, the average heron. And these birds are really, like, secretive. And the owls and the ravens are generally animals that are associated with sorcery and magic. And I think this pusik here is hinting at the secret societies inside Edom. And they haven't quite come to the surface. I believe there was a ritual, maybe the 32nd degree of Scottish Rite Masonry, <laughs> talked about some kind of a tangu, like it's like all the different like kinds of knights, like the Teutonic Knights, the Templar Knights, and they would all, all these secret organizations would come, you know, to fight this battle around Jerusalem. It's, it's very strange. But there's like these secret plans, these secret plans of Edom and Amalek, and when they boil to the surface, it, it, it's terrifying. Like we, we've seen it uh, in Nazi Germany, when this occultism, these secret societies become, when the wizarding world takes over the muggle world, so to say, they, they become the governing power. It's this very dark times, and, and it seems like this may happen, you know, in the days of Mashiach, 
I mean, we only see really the anti-Semitism coming in publicly from Yishmael right now, but but it's there, unfortunately. It's 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 not it's not ruling, it's not controlling, thank God, but it, it's there underneath the surface. And we got a little bit of glimpse of it in Charlottesville, where the bizarre, you know, they had the little neo-Nazi haircuts and they had little tiki torches, and they were like, the Jews will not replace us. But that neo-Nazism, it's there. It's, it's not in power, but chas uh, if it ever comes to power again. And then the final plague was the Makos Bechoros. So here, the Yalku Shimoni, he quotes uh, Yechezkel. It looks like it's Lamed Bey's uh, Lamed, so it would be uh, Ezekiel uh, 32.30. And he says, Shama Nesiche Tzafon. He says, the princes of the north. So I'm going to read you both of the Pusiks here, Pasuki. It's very interesting. So he says, this is talking about the final destruction of Edom. He says, There is Edom, her kings and all her princes, her 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 Nesih Safon, the princes of the north, who were laid despite their might with the victims of the sword, the Khalale Kareb. Because if we look at the 2024 year history of Edom, you know, there's many wars, many battles to build all these empires, but now they are the victims of the sword. Now they die in this final battle. They will lie with the Areli and the uncircumcised together with those who descend to the pit, the boar. They there are princes of the north, all of them and every Sidoni, every uh, Sidoni, which is interesting because now it's mentioning another city in Lebanon again. So it seems to be this history of Edom, which we'll, I'll get back to in a second. So those who descended with the slain, when they were broken from their might in Boshim and, and shame, they lie uncircumcised with those slain by the sword, bearing their shame with those who descend to the pit. This is Yechezkel. It's uh, chapter 32. I believe it's I believe it's the 29th and the 30th and, I don't know, 31st and 32nd Pusik. I, I, I have to look it up again. Um, but what it, what's talking about? Why why is the, the, they being called a Raelim, uncircumcised? And, it, and it's Hashem saying that you, you know, you were the brother of Yaakov, you were the son of Yitzhak. You, Esav, you were the son of Yitzhak, of Isaac. You were the grandson of Abraham, Abraham. But yet you didn't, you didn't accept the mitzvah of bris mila. You didn't accept the circumcision. You didn't enter into the covenant with Hashem. You didn't uphold the mitzvos and learning his Torah for thousands of years and doing his mitzvos. And now you lay with the rest of the Uralian. You, you were part of the family and your Roman empire. So, so what does this all mean? So it's interesting. In, in Sefer Daniel, it describes the fourth beast. There, the four beasts are the four empires of history, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Median Empire, the Greek Empire, and then finally Edom. And we find ourselves now in the 2024 years of the Roman ex exile, the Gullus Edom. And that beast is described as having ten horns. And then there's this little horn that rises up and it knocks out three of the horns. And I believe what it's talking about is it talks, it, it speaks to the original ten, like emperors, Caesars of the Roman Empire, the ancient, the beginning of Rome. But I believe what it also talks about is there's ten phases of the Roman Empire throughout history. He, Nebuchadnezzar, he sees a statue of two iron legs. So one is Western Rome, one's Eastern Rome. You know, Eastern Rome is in, you know, was founded by Emperor Constantine in Constantinople in modern-day Turkey. Western Rome, of course, is Rome in Italy. But these go through phases throughout history. So I believe after these, you know, so you can look at all these phases, like there's the Holy Roman Empire. You know, you can look at the empires of, of France, the empires of Spain, you know, the empire of Germany, of England. They, they, they all have a phase. And so, too, probably in the Eastern Roman Empire. So it's possible, I believe, that Russia is now the, the powerful modern embodiment of the Eastern Roman Empire, and America, the USA, is the, the, the final embodiment of the Western Roman Empire. And so if you want to look at the little horn, America as a nation could be this little horn because it knocked out three very powerful empires. It knocked out you know, the British Empire, the French Empire, and the Spanish Empire. Oh, it's very strange for us to understand all this because Right now, Baruch Hashem, like we, 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 you know, been treated well in the modern Western world. You know, there's not the pogroms anymore. There's not the, the, the anti-Semitic mobs. Only, unfortunately, we see it starting from, from the children of Yishmael, from, from the Arab nations, and even, you know, in Europe and America, and the protesting for the, the Palestinians and, and Hamas and just all of it. But unfortunately, it's all growing. 
And it seems like we're in the beginning, we're right on the verge of that war between Edom and Paras, between America and Iran. And then it says, the Tosafos in uh, Masekta of Odazara, Beis Amabes, it says that, you know, Iran will fall, it will be defeated by America, America will rule the world for, rule the entire world for nine months. What that means, entire world, does that mean also Israel itself? And those nine months are what's called the Chevle Mashiach, the birth pangs of Mashiach, because labor, I mean, when, when, when a mother's carrying the baby, you carry it for nine months before the delivery, and then the delivery is Mashiach. So, Bezrat Hashem, we're close, Bezrat Hashem, we are protected as we go through this very terrifying period, but, but it, it's to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael, back to the land of Israel, to, bring, to restore our relationship with Hashem, to rebuild the base of Mikdash, the return of Navua, of prophecies so we can have a close relationship again with Hashem. And then, Bizrat Hashem, after all these scary wars and all this, we get to the true peace, a world that's all connected in peace and shalom, and where everyone sees that we're all sons and daughters of the infinite being, of one infinite being, Hashem, who really is the Ava Rachamin, the father of compassion, who loves all of his creations, and we can get to this beautiful, peaceful, united world, hopefully soon. <laughs> all right, so hope you enjoyed it. Hope to see you back again soon on Sweet Good Torah.